Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 134, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Mr. Peter Oliphant. Now Peter's probably best known to guys like us for designing Stonekeep, which I uh, covered in a retrospective a few episodes back. But he's also known uh, for designing some of the earliest electronic handheld games, uh, specifically for Mattel. I'm pretty sure you've seen his football game before. Uh, he's also, on top of all this, a childhood actor. And we talk a little bit in uh, this video about his, uh, his time uh, working on the Dick Van Dyke show, as well as uh, working with Jimmy Stewart on a movie. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Peter Oliphant. Okay. Hi folks, I am here with Peter Oliphant. He is a 30-year veteran of the games industry. He's probably best known for his work on Stone Keep and Lexicross. How are you doing today, Peter? Very good. How are you? Doing great. Now, 30 years is a long time, and I was looking over some of your uh, some of the notes on Facebook and such, and I noticed that you uh, worked for Mattel for a while doing uh, handhelds. I just wondering, you know, if we could start there and just sort of tell me, how did you get involved in this? Well, an interesting thing, I was uh, working out for the military, actually, with Spirit Univac, or a company like it called Bunker Ramo, and I decided to apply to Mattel, just be out of the blue, it turns out, they, I did not look at advertisements or anything like that. And while I was applying, I then went back east. And when I came back, there was a phone call to me. Turns out they were looking for game people the same week I sent in my application. It was a total coincidence. So I got hired. Uh, the first thing that happened when I got hired is they gave me the task of, I never used a 6502 program or a CPU before. They gave me the task, they had this game called Gravity, which they already had three games done, but they wanted to have another game for it, and they wanted me to, within four weeks, come, or I think it was six weeks, come up with four new games, program on a 6502 I had never done, and present it to them, which I did. They picked one of the games to go into the thing, and it impressed them enough that I sort of had a meteoric rise there, where every six months they gave me a raise, and they had a policy there that if they give you a raise they have and a promotion, they have to therefore give you another review in another six months. And so I ended up getting reviews all the time and ended up in three years becoming from what was a programmer trainee to manager of the home computer software area. So, so what were some of the names of these handheld games that you worked on? Okay, Gravity was one. Uh, let me see. Uh, World describe, describe them a little bit because I'm sure oh, people sure. have a little idea. Of, <laughs> you know, this whole little, is, to me it's a is, fascinating is, niche of gaming that doesn't really get a lot of attention. So true it's because it's sort of migrated about. now to the to the computers completely. Gravity was a game that was based on. It was supposed to be the theme of every game was gravity. So one of them was a coin toss one where you know the old coin toss where a nickel drops and you have to stop it. One of was that. The, oh, by the way, the entire screen, to give you an idea, was three dots by seven dots, meaning that was the entire thing with a little tiny graphic, if you will, about it. But if you remember how the Mattel handhelds were, they just had little blips on there. Uh, the other games, the one that I created was uh, Docking, which was one that was based on non gravity, where you had to dock two spaceships and a uh, spaceship and a thing. One spaceship was represented by a dot, the other spaceship was represented by a a diamond, and so you had to get them one. They were moving down the screen at different rates. You had to slow one up, speed one down, and then finally get them so they would be going in sync, and then press the button. So that was one of them. Juggling was another, where you had three objects on three uh, dots on there in three rows, and by using uh, gravity formulas, you know how it works with a squared and all that kind of stuff, that you could get them to go up and down, and you had to. There was a line, and if they drop below, you couldn't get them to move up again if they, before they dropped below the line, but once they dropped below the line, you had to hit it again, so your timing had to be when they were down at the bottom, so it simulated that. Uh, obviously, World Championship Football was, that was actually the crown jewel for me there, so there's a couple in between there I'll get back to, but World Championship Football was one where you uh, had these buttons on one side. It was two-player games, so it was almost like a tabletop thing. It had a full screen in the middle. You had two sets of controls, and you actually programmed each of the plays of the players in each case, which is an interesting story because Jeff Rockless, who happened to be the head of Mattel at the time, he gave me the task of making it so that you picked set plays. In other words, there was like seven or eight set plays, and you chose between them. And I said a better idea would be if you could actually program your own, or actually every time you actually programmed your own plays. 
So what happened was is that he told me I had to do it his way, but he never told me I couldn't do it my way. So when it came time for demonstration time, I showed him his way, and then I showed him my way. And one of the uh, things that really impressed my boss is not trying to give up any ground. Jeff Rockless looked at the rest of the people and said, so we're all in agreement that planning your own, not having set plays, but doing the other place is the best way to go. And they all go, yes, that's the best way. And so they moved on. No, no acknowledgement at the moment of the fact that that was my idea and it was against the idea he had turned down, but that's the way they went. Uh, other games that I did, I did another football game called Standalone Football, which was a first-person perspective in there where you actually looked like your guy was moving through the field. I did one called Speed Freak, which was based on uh, road racing games. And so that was one. I discovered an interesting thing there that from the computer's point of view, a turn to the right is merely shifting the graft over to the right as opposed to an actual turn. And that's where I learned that. So those are the basic handhelds that I did while I was there. I did about four or five, and they're all in the classic computer game history. Or They have this collection now that they tour and stuff, so it's in the museum at this point. So, And by the way, you can find those on Facebook. I have the pictures of those on Facebook. So, Awesome. Now, you, I think you said it was three by seven dots <laughs> some of these games. I mean, I mean, I have people on this show complaining about how primitive uh, the Commodore 64 was, you know, in terms of you know, graphics cap capabilities. I mean, how do you even get into a mindset of making a game when you're when you have that kind of limitation that you're working with? Basically, by exactly what you said, you just take the limitation into account. You work with what you have instead of worrying about what you didn't have. Plus, that was the best screen I had ever worked with at the time. I mean, it was uh, things have developed up. There was one point that all games were basically just. I mean, there weren't really anything physical. I mean, take a look at World... What is it? Uh, they have another football game, a very popular one. I forget what it's called. Just the regular football game where they added passing to it, but you... Uh, I don't know how to describe how you figure out how to do that, but you look at... at well, for a 3x7 display, first of all, I did have bright and dark, meaning I, I had off and I had on and I had bright. So I <laughs> actually... There was... Think Next about this... technology. But that's three. That's three states. There are twenty-one different, uh, twenty-one different uh, locations. So therefore, there is twenty-one to the third power different. Uh, what you call it? Screens you can use. That's a huge number of screens. So the way you think about it is, how do you combine the various screen possibilities to turn into a game? Adding to the fact that you have dynamics of time, meaning how you change it over time makes things so. You just break it down to that. Plus, we had sound a little bit, but I think the sound was just beep. I could do a beep. Um, oh, I, we could actually generate different frequencies of sounds. And one, another interesting story is the way they worked at Mattel is, is that they had two different groups. One group did the prototype, and I was in the prototype group, meaning we came up with the ideas. We did the prototype, which is an excellent way of doing that. Then you show it to people. Everyone approves exactly of what the prototype is supposed to be, which is what the product is supposed to be. Then a brand new group of people take it. They start over from scratch and make that same product as efficiently as possible. I got to work with an 8-bit CPU. The actual final program with the 4-bit. Believe it or not, there are 4-bit CPUs that can only count up from 8, from what is it, 7, minus 7 to positive 8. That's all they can do. The guy that was working on it actually came to me and he said, what, you have to give me the frequencies of each one of the notes. And I go, well, just look them up, you know, and an A is this, uh, you know, uh, what you do, re, mi, fa, sol, uh, you know, look each one in terms of a frequency. But he had me specify, and I said, well, I didn't specify it to give you the leeway to work with what you did since you have so many restrictions. And it turns out later on, he goes, well, I really couldn't use those frequencies because I had the restrictions. You know, so he didn't need to do I sort of pre-anticipated the fact that you have to give, with that kind of limitation, you have to give other programmers leeway to work within it. If you specify it exactly, it may be impossible to do because, I mean, like, he was also working with insane, like, maybe 1K of memory to work with for six games. I mean, this is the kind of restrictions we had back there. If you remember, uh, BASIC started off as 4K BASIC, and that was considered a bragging point because it was 4K. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, when we get to Stonekeep, there'll be some interesting topics there because my, just to, not to segue, but we'll get back to that, but Stonekeep, I was giving some, in, some very interesting initial restrictions to the program that later on had to be released, uh, re, you know, relaxed because it never would have worked. Well, tell me about this sort of 
atmosphere at Mattel at this time. You know, these guys sort of in suits and ties, very formal kind of, uh, you know, what, what's the uh, environment like? You're right about the corporate uh, Mattel at the time, but Richard Chang, who headed up the what was called the, re the design and developments, we were really research and development, we call ourselves design and development. He set up an area that was totally separated from the rest of the company. We were in the same building, but we had our own area. And our area was so secret or, or was so specific that we could go anywhere in the building, but nobody else could come into our section, which, I mean, we could even go into the section that was top secret about creating toys, which uh, I think was the third floor, which in the olden days we were told was very top secret because uh, Mattel had been at one point uh, commissioned to design tanks. So it was actually military at some point. But we were allowed to go anywhere. We had actually a red dot on our badge they put specially to make it so that only we could go into our area. But it was a very laid back area. I mean, we were all given, even though we had incredibly horrendous schedules in terms of like me, I was given, I had four weeks to do six games. They would give me that and then they wouldn't bother me. It was just go ahead and do it. I do remember that the area that we were in was extremely, it was like they just set out an area that, okay, you guys can use this area because we're not using it. For example, next to where I was sitting was an open live wire. I mean, if I had stuck my finger down, I would have been electrocuted type thing. I mean, we were in an area that was really open. There was no, there was no walls or anything. We were all sitting in one huge room with just desks inside of there, but it was probably it was so funny. It was probably the best environment I had ever been in because I was in a think tank. I mean, the first job I ever had doing this. I'm in a think tank. I'm able to create my own games. I'm moving up the ladder fast. And by the time I was done, I had seven employees working under me. So it, which by the way, was the beginning of the end for Mattel Electronics because they had taken the concept that the game industry was going like this, so it continued to go like this. And of course, it flattened out. And so Mattel Electronics started off with a certain number of people. Everyone that was in Mattel Electronics at that point was made a manager, almost everybody was made a manager, and everybody had to hire seven more people. When you increase the size of the company by eight, or actually, yeah, by eight, instantaneously, if there isn't, like, the demand for it out there immediately, it has problems, and Mattel Electronics died a year later because of that. But in the beginning, it was... Oh, and also, by the way, in the beginning... The, the handheld group and the intelligent group were the same people. Later on, they separated them, and I'm sure Gabriel Baum, when you interviewed him, spoke of that particular thing, meaning they actually, he became the head of them. And there was a little bit of animosity because, hey, we started this out, and then all of a sudden they kept their stuff secret from us, or we couldn't go over there. And it was strange that way, but it, it all worked out in the mix because we did actually help with them, and they helped with us. But... It was so much nicer when we all had just complete free. Oh, the other interesting thing is the guy that hired me quit a week after I was there. So I felt kind of weird that, well, wait a minute. I thought I got hired by you. How come you're no longer working here? I forget his name, but uh, but he went on and did other things too. But yeah, it was it was a nice environment. I'm just still, my mind is still uh, reeling from this uh, fact that they, <laughs> the same guys are making these toys, are making real tanks, you know. <laughs> What's up with that? Did they, actually going, make, did they actually make tanks or was this like sort of prototypes, uh, blueprints type stuff? Or what, what are we talking about? As I understand, it was during World War II, so this is before all of us. Oh. But yes, in other words, if you think about it, take a look at a toy tank. Toy tanks are very much scale models, what real tanks are. So I, as I understand the story, remember, I'm only hearing this too, but I was there and they told these kind of stories. Uh, what it was is, is that the government came to them and says, well, you guys make toy tanks you can help us design the real thing. And so they cordoned off an area. And actually, I don't know to how much they had influence or how many of those tanks actually made it to the real market. But, yeah, they consulted uh, Mattel to actually uh, do that. And of course, as a result, like I said, that area was, I mean, you should have seen the security. I mean, you, you, it was like the third floor. You get off on the thing, and there are like two security guards sitting there immediately saying, do you have authorization to be on this floor? And this is after all this stuff. I mean, when I was there, they were no longer doing tanks or anything, but they kept the security, that thing. And, you know, I just show my badge with a little red dot. They go, oh, okay. <laughs> and they were a little bit, they kind of were, uh, the people there were okay about it, but how come you can come to our area and we can't go to your area? But, of course, we didn't set up the rules, but we felt kind of good about that. <laughs> so you were right in the thick of it uh, during this uh, video game crash about that. At that time, right? So, 
Oh, yeah. I'm just sort of curious what that was like from uh, your perspective, right in the middle of it. Yes, uh, actually, that's interesting. The first thing that most people don't realize is if you go back in time, there was a t time before the crash that you mentioned, which was about like 1985-ish or something. I'm not really quite sure what year, but <clears throat> at, there was a time that the game industry was hugely popular. There were video games. There were, there were like game shows being created based on computer games and stuff. And just to let you know what we think caused it was just generally people started thinking that you put anything out as a video game and it would sell. The worst case being, I believe it was Atari that had, um, let me see, E.T. and Raiders of the Lost Ark as two games. And if you bought both games, you realize you bought the exact same game with just different graphics. And the, and the game was hideous. It was, like a, it was like a maze that you walked through and you got, uh, what did E.T. like? He liked uh, Skittles. Reese's Pieces. Reese's Pieces. You got the Reese's Pieces, and if you got them all, you were done, and it was a nothing game. And people, uh, the problem was, is when games were good back there, and everyone was just doing them. Paying thirty dollars a game was okay, but as soon as you pay thirty dollars, which is a lot of money back there for a game, and it's no good anymore, you stop. You get really burnt, and that people started getting burnt. They go, I, "We're going to be a little bit more cautious about what we buy." Now, what was it like for me? Well. I was thinking back then that I was on the fast train to a Hollywood-like, because I'd come from Hollywood, as you know, a Hollywood-like industry that was going to pick up and everyone was going to be famous and everyone was going to be rich and stuff like that. So it was a real downer when it crashed and all of a sudden uh, computer game companies didn't exist anymore. And at that time, many of us had to consider working for companies other than computer game companies. And... The most amazing thing is computer game programming is by far one of the hardest and most complicated forms of programming because it has to be interactive, you have to deal with sound, you have to deal with the complexities of the hardware, everything. And yet you go to a company and you go, oh, you guys are just kids that do games. You don't know anything about programming and you couldn't convince them otherwise. And so many of us couldn't get jobs even though our ability at programming was light years above your typical programmer. So it was very discouraging that and it took about three or four years before it recovered so now you mentioned uh, your Hollywood background and, you know when I was doing some research on you I for the longest time I thought well there must be another guy you know with the same name that I keep you know <laughs> coming across but uh, you uh, was it were a child actor oh yeah on the was a Freddie helper on the uh, Dick Van Dyke show just that's one I have like 20 or 30 credits in acting I mean that's, how one, that's the most famous. I mean, this is something I just know nothing about. I mean, how do you, what's it like being a child actor? How, how did you get involved? Were, you, were your parents uh, actors? I mean, what, what's the story here? You're close. You're actually very close. This is a very, it seems like everything about me has these little interesting stories about that. In this case, I was four years old, okay? And my, what it is is my entire family had moved from places like Iowa and various places in the, in the United States to come to Hollywood because they heard about Hollywood because they wanted to be actors and actresses and producers and stuff like that because that was the emergency industry at the time so they came here and they literally formed a child mor a morning kids show that was live on channel 5 KTLA in Los Angeles which was right down the block from where I lived and they basically the people on the show my uncle was a clown my uh, my stepfather was like, he, oh, it was based on, it was called Air Patrol, and it was based on everybody being on a plane or something. That kind of thing, as if we were on a plane doing the stuff with kids that showed up. And all my relatives are on this show, right? And like I said, every week they had kids on. It's just special. They got toys, and they got to talk to them and stuff like that. So what happened was that I was on the second week as one of those kids, well, I'm a four-year-old. I know nothing about how society works or anything like that. This is live TV, and so it was near Christmas time. My uncle's making this little tiny, um, how do I put it? It's a picture of a uh, Christmas tree. And he said, now, if I had time, I would cut this out and show it to you. So <laughs> it's live TV, and I look over, and I tap him on the shoulder, and I say, I have time. Let me cut it out. <laughs> so he goes, okay, sure. So he goes on with the show, and I cut it out when I'm done. I show it to him, and I give it to him. They go, see, and it looked like that. The director and the producer loved that, and unbeknownst to me, I thought it was already a regular. They made me a regular of the show, so I was on every week on this live TV show. So once you've got credits, it's a lot easier to get. And I'm four years old, and so a lot of people were impressed when I'd go on an interview that a four-year-old could actually do work. So I actually 
I, there was one thing called Taker, She's Mine, where I was going to be the head of a series that they did a pilot for, but it never made it. And so one of the reasons it didn't make it, I finally saw it on TV, is uh, they say is that they took my voice and they substituted a adult man's voice in for my voice. It, I, it was totally bizarre. I have no idea why they did it. But once I had those credits, I started being farmed out by my parents and relatives in order to do other parts. And one of the things that and it actually came up very quickly was the Dick Van Dyke show. So I did that, and since Freddie Helper was the kid next door, like anything on TV, anytime they used the kid next door visually, they brought me in. Now, every time they did that, they still interviewed me because that was just part of their policy, but they would always tell me, you're the one that's going to get it. And in fact, I have this kind of cool story where about the third time it happened, that I was being interviewed, they were introducing me around the table to Dick Van Dyke and all these people and Mary Tyler Moore, who's, you can get an idea of what she's like at this point, looked at me when I said hi, she goes, you can call me Mary. So I mean, this is the kind of environment and type of people that they were. And so I felt pretty much at home. Jerry Paris, who played my father on the show and was the director, just to give you a sort of advance on this, later on I became an extra as my summer job for uh, when I was in college. And I worked on room on what was it? I'm sorry, Happy Days, which Jerry Paris was the director of. So at one point I walked up to him while I was on an extra, and I said, "Can I talk to you?" He goes, "No, I'm busy right now." And then later on I walk up and he says, "Okay, well, what did you want to talk to me about?" And I said, "Well, I played your son on the Dick Van Dyke show," and he just about melted. And from that point on, any time any extra got a bit that was big, he gave it. In fact, he said, "Do you want to go home? I'll pay you full might, and you can just go home." And I go, "No, no, I want to earn my money and stuff." So anytime anybody even got came close to getting a line on the show, it would be me. I never got a line. He tried to give me a line a few times, but they wouldn't allow it. But that was kind. Of, that shows you how Hollywood works. It's who you know. I mean, immediately on that show, I was on every day. I was getting all sorts of stuff. But it it was. But Dick Van Dyke show was wonderful. I keep thinking. I always thought I was on like five episodes, but I was only on three. But it was still a wonderful. Once every year, by the way, I was never on twice in the same year. So. That seems bizarre. I wouldn't have expected them to keep re-interviewing. I mean, what if they want to bring in a different actor for the same role? I mean, is that... I don't know why they did that. It could be that maybe... I, I, I've only had one guess. If they only just used me, maybe my agent could have more bargaining power. Like, well, if he's the guy that's always going to play this, you're going to have to start paying him twice as much. I'm just thinking how the business works on this. If they interview more people... They can say, well, if you're going to get a little bit persnicky about this, we'll just hire somebody else to do this. And since I was only on once a year, most people probably wouldn't stop or start watching the show because of it. And, you know, there's plenty of instances now where they replace people on soap operas. And that one guy on Spartacus that died, they replaced the actor on that. So, of course, when you die, there's a good excuse. But that would be my guess is that by interviewing me, it made it so my agent, who are very, you know, they're so magnanimous when it comes to money. They're not asking for money. No, I'm just joking. That's their job <laughs> to get as much as possible. In fact, as I recall, I do think my, my what you call relatives told me that my agent almost got me out of the third one by trying to ask for too much money. And, of course, I was saying, I want to do the work. I mean, this is, I mean, it's. It's not money that's going to make you live forever anyway. And back then, royalties, even though I still get royalties for the show, like, maybe $6 a year or something, you still get those checks every once in a while. But that would be my guess, is the business aspect of it. So did you get to, uh, you know, I don't want to spend too long on this show, but did you get to, like, hang out with Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore, or was this, uh, this no. you're, in, you're in to do your job and then you're out of there? I mean, how? Pretty much the latter. I did my job. When you're on the show, everyone's friendly, everyone's nice and like that, but when the I don't think I even ever went out to eat with Richie on the show, meaning we never even hung out. Needless to say, we hung out more on the set than me with, like, say, Mary Tyler Moore. And the people in the office, like Maury Amsterdam, uh, what was it, uh, Rose Marie and those, and Mel, Mel Cooley, I never even, hardly even talked to them or even saw them because when they're doing their scenes, I'm not doing my scenes. But, yeah, it's not like afterwards I made friends with Dick Van Dyke and we hang out or so that. The closest to that would be, again, when the, I w was an extra, which is kind of a fun job, too. And when I was an extra, I was put up for the Mary Tyler Moore show. And when they rejected me, they still sent somebody out to say, but we recognized who you are, and Mary appreciates that you came in for the thing. 
So I didn't get to talk to her at that point, but the fact is they did recognize me. But it, uh, nah. Now, I, I never really hung out with anybody that I worked with. However, I do have actor friends who, uh, have you ever heard of Brad Dorff? He's the voice for Chucky, and he was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest as Billy Bobbitt. He's one of my better friends, even though I don't see him all the time because he's so busy. But nobody that I ever worked with really became friends in Hollywood because I worked with them in Hollywood. So. And you were in a movie, too. I think it was uh, Mr. Hobbs' uh, Vacation with Jimmy Stewart. Takes a Vacation. Oh, what was it? Mr. Hobbs takes a vacation. Oh, Mr. Hobbs takes a vacation. Yeah, I think I've actually seen that a couple of times. <laughs> you know, so that's a um, fun movie. I, if you want a story about that, it was I. We did that on location. First of all, the the uh, movie it was so much fun. First of all, I got to be called Peter in it. And I remember when I interviewed for that, uh, the director just had me crack jokes and stuff like that. I remember coming out of the interview, and my uncle, who took me to the interview, said something on the order of, oh, you shouldn't have been just joking. You should have been really serious about that. But apparently the director really liked the fact that I was easy, casual going, and he gave me that. The fun part about that movie is if you have seen it, there's a girl in there that is the bombshell. She's the blonde bombshell that's supposedly having an affair with somebody there, but they can't say that back then on TV. When we used to drive to the location, she used to insist that I sit on her lap. And, of course, today, if I realize, at the point, it bothered me because I'm a little <laughs> kid because there was these, uh, you know, she was kind of bumpy and stuff. But today, I go, oh, my God, why didn't I just get a whole bunch of fun out of that? Uh, another fun story about that is we had, it was during Christmas that we were filming and Dick, uh, not Dick Van Dyke, um, Jimmy Stewart had gotten gifts for everyone on the set, but he had forgotten to get me a gift. And I remember, I can remember this visually. He walks out of his trailer. He looks at me and go, and thinks, oh, no, I didn't get him a gift. He walked back into his trailer, came back, and gave me a gift. That gift was a bottle of scotch. I'm about <laughs> seven years old at night. I'm like about seven years old at the time. I, to this day, I wish my parents had kept it. They ended up drinking it. This is something I wish I had in my collection, but the story itself is pretty cool. So, and then you were let's see, what was it? Uh, Hot rods to hell. Hot rods. Like that earlier. That that's uh, you had a DVD uh, release party for that pretty recently, right? So. Yeah, well, about two or three years ago. But in c considering the movie's about twenty plus years old, yeah, that's somewhat recent. Uh, I actually talked to the guy that bought the rights to it. That used to be called Fifty Two Miles to Terror when we actually when the script was written. And uh, that was a lot of fun, although I didn't have a name in that movie. I was called Boy in the Park. <laughs> and a, fun story, a fun story about that, if you like, is uh, one part of the movie is I'm supposed to kick a football, right, and kick it to actually the star of the show. I forget his name. But um, the thing is, is that when they set it up, where I'm supposed to kick, they want to, they want to take a picture of me. But that means that the actor isn't really where I'm supposed to kick the football to. Instead, where I'm supposed to kick the football to, there's a whole bunch of lights set up and cameras. And I sat there and go, I was actually mindset enough to say, you want me to kick this in the direction of all that equipment? I mean, what if I miss and start <laughs> destroying things? As it turns out, my kick was perfect. It went right to where the actor was supposed to be. It went over all the equipment. They had, took one take and they were done. And I was just so relieved because, I mean, needless to say, if I hit the equipment, they wouldn't have blamed me for it. But I just felt conscious about the fact that I could have hit all this equipment. So, um, and so and these are like uh, really, I mean, it's really kind of fun to, uh, all, to remember these kind of things. So. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the second part of this interview with Peter. And uh, believe me, there's a lot of great stuff coming up. I mean, we haven't even gotten into the interplay and stone keep stuff yet. So I think you guys will really find that interesting. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned. I know you're going to enjoy it. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show. It really means a lot to me, guys. I uh, personally I always uh, support these shows uh, that I watch regularly and find entertaining. And, you know, I know some of you guys are on the fence about this, but it really only takes a couple of minutes. It's really easy to set up a PayPal uh, account, and you can make a one-time donation or uh, a regular subscription. Uh, Five dollars a month is what a lot of people have gone with. It's uh, very simple, and you can cancel this at any time you want, so you don't feel like you're obligated to anything. Uh, but I think if you guys uh, could only see all of the work that I put into these episodes, uh, you really wouldn't want to begrudge me a couple of dollars. So, you know, please uh, do that if you haven't already. And as always, I'll really, really appreciate it. 
uh, everyone who has uh, supported the show. Okay, now that that's out of the way, I'm kind of thirsty already. You know, what can I do about this thirst? Ah, look what we have here. <laughs> Thanks uh, to Stuart, and uh, by the way, I'll be toasting you again, Stuart. I have the Brooklyn Local Number 2. Uh, now, last time, you remember, I had the number one. <laughs> so, uh, number one, number two. Uh, yeah, not talking about uh, bodily functions here. I'm talking about brew. Now, this one, again, it says it's uh, brewed with honey and citrus peel. Uh, let's hope it's also brewed with hops and some uh, barley or wheat or whatever they put in here. Now, let's see, European malt and hops, Belgian dark sugar, and raw wildflower honey from a New York family farm. Wow. Oh, let's see, does it tell the alcohol content here? 9% uh, alcohol. Now, I know some of you guys don't want me to do the L of the Week segment anymore, so I'm not uh, actually going to drink this on the... <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. Come on, you think I'd give in to haters like that? Uh, let's get this open and see what the number two is all about. Uh, I hope this isn't like the, the number one was the good one, and this is the <laughs> second rate one. <laughs> Let's see if I can do this up. Put my eye out. Ah! All right. Well, sounds good. So I pour in the old drinking horn here and see what we've got. Yeah. Some of you guys have been asking me where I got my drinking horn. Actually, there's a little thing here, a little festival every year in Minnesota called the Little Falls Arts and Crafts Festival. And there is a little Viking booth. I like these guys dress up as Vikings with all the horns and everything. And they sell these. Uh, if, if I can think about it, I'll po post a link to the guy's website. I'm not sure if he sells these online or not. Uh, but anyway, that's that's how I got mine. I just went to his booth and I think it was something like 60 bucks. And he filled it up uh, with woodchuck, I believe. I think I'm going to do a little bit better than woodchuck uh, tonight. So let's see what we've got. Now this one is uh, definitely have that Belgian-y... Belgian-y, is that a word? A sort of Belgian, very floral uh, scent to this. About the only way I can describe it. A little kind of kind of apple -y. you know. I was just thinking about you know, talking about woodchuck. Uh, you can almost imagine this is uh, has some apple. Uh, it must be the orange peel or something. I don't know what's giving it that uh, that scent. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a taste. Hmm. How to describe that? Uh, probably need another taste. Okay, yeah, this one I can definitely taste more alcohol uh, flavor in it. But not necessarily a bad thing. Um, sort of, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the words to describe this. Almost like uh, if you eat some raisins, that sort of aftertaste after you've eaten the raisins, you know, sort of tasting something like that. Again, sort of a mild apple-y uh, taste. I don't know where that's coming from either. <clears throat> This is a pretty, uh, pretty rich uh, brew here. I don't know. I don't know if this is something you want to casually just sit around and and quaff large portions of. I definitely wouldn't recommend a, a whole horn full, unless you're. <laughs> well, I'm probably going to do it anyway, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Yeah, very strong. Uh, uh, very a lot stronger, uh, more powerful uh, tasting than the uh, number one. So. Uh, I probably would go for the number one over the number two, but uh, still very enjoyable. And I would you know, <laughs> definitely rather have this than a woodchuck. So I'm going to put that up. Let me put that away. That's getting to me already. It's really strong. Okay, let's see if I can remember the quotation even for this uh, week's episode. Uh, and I really, really like this quotation. It comes from uh, Jimmy Stewart. And it goes, I, I couldn't agree more with the sentiment in this quotation. Uh, so let me, uh, <laughs> let's get this done. <laughs> All right. According to Jimmy Stewart, and I quote, Never treat the audience as customers, always as partners. See you guys next week.